are lucky and thrilled. And I just want to, again, express my thanks um, to Katie, who stepped in at the very last minute to be able to give us um, a talk today. Um, so I want to quickly introduce um, Dr. Barnhill Dilling, who's a postdoctoral research scholar here at North Carolina State University in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources. Uh, she's trained as a social scientist who's been exploring um, just environmental decision making. Um, and I'll let her um, provide you some more details um, as well. Um, and just quickly, next week's colloquium, um, we won't be meeting um, in person for a colloquium next week. Um, here in the US, it's election day. So we want people to have the ability to go out and vote if they haven't voted yet but also to help get people to the polls and just in general reflect on um, the importance of civic engagement. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Barnhill Dilling um, with our great thanks again, Katie, for, for stepping in um, at the last minute. Um, and one last thing, we are gonna reschedule Dr. Um, June's talk, um, hopefully for the spring when hopefully things have settled down in Colorado and everyone um, is safe again. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to you, Katie. Thanks, Todd, um, and thanks for the opportunity even in such unfortunate circumstances and certainly keeping everyone in all the fire zones around the country in our thoughts. And I'm pulling up my screen share to make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. All right. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Katie Barnhill Dilling. Like Todd mentioned, I'm a postdoc in forestry and environmental resources, but I do most of my work through the GES Center, and I'm sorry my light is really hard to adjust. Um, I am going to introduce some ideas today that came out of my doctoral research. So I'm using data, sort of a couple of years old data, to introduce some newer ideas that I'm chewing on. And so starting from the data phase, moving into some more like hopefully next steps ideas. And I look forward to your feedback and discussion at the end. Uh, starting us off with a land acknowledgement. So again, wherever we are in the United States or Canada, we're gathered on occupied and unceded territory um, or land of many tribal groups, especially in North Carolina that have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. And here in Northwest Durham, where I am right now, um, I'm on traditional homelands of the Okaneechee Confederation, including the Eno, Saponi, and Shikori, and about a county over from contemporary homeland, homelands of the Okaneechee Band of the Saponi. Uh, and as we start a pretty heady conversation today about epistemology, noting the history of the land and the different ways humans relate to it, to me is particularly important. Um, and I am not native, I like to do allied scholarship and I wanna make that really clear up front. So I'm always looking for ways to do a better job of that. And I'm still used to being a walk and talker. So I'm trying really hard to sit still. And I start off, um, I started off thinking about these questions when I learned about the genetically engineered American chestnut tree. And this is sort of the starting question that will move through a lot of both data and sort of speculative ideas moving forward through the presentation. Um, so should we resurrect, and I'll introduce this a little more clearly in a moment, so should we resurrect the American chestnut tree with genetic engineering? Uh, and more pointedly, on what basis should we make this decision? The USDA public comment period just ended on Monday. Monday? Yes, for, the, for, for this tree. Um, and what's considered part of the decision-making and what isn't? is really critical here. Um, and how can we look beyond the sort of go or no-go decision that comes out of the regulatory system and think more broadly about governance, so actors beyond just the state. And while this talk comes from Chestnut work, it certainly can apply to some of these other um, emerging applications of species protection using gene editing or genetic engineering. But we are starting with the chestnut. And for those of you who have not lived in my brain for the past six years or Jason's or someone else on the project, um, just a quick reminder that the American chestnut tree used to be considered the redwoods of the east. Um, it used to account for upwards of one in four trees in its range along the Appalachian Ridge here in the Eastern United States. 
It was a keystone species. Um, its mast crop was more reliable than the oaks that replaced them, for example. It fed a lot of wildlife, it fed humans. Historically, it was really important to Cherokee in the Southern Appalachians and to the Haudenosaunee communities of central and upstate New York. Um, it was the backbone of European American Appalachian culture. Um, there's a, a pretty famous and a very small circle quote, you were rocked to sleep as a baby in a chestnut cradle and you were buried in a casket made of chestnut. Um, so it was really critical part of life in its historic range. And then an invasive, an invasive blight entered the US in the early 20th century. And within a few decades, billions of chestnut trees were lost. Uh, the chestnut blight is persistent. It lives on other trees rather innocuously and even in the soil. So other management tools to try to remediate its um, effect on the chestnut were pretty useless. And, and breeding, breeding is slow. Thinking about trees that live over 100 years, breeding cycles are slow. So in the 1900s, scientists at SUNY ESF turned to the tools of genetic engineering to the chestnut problem. Uh, the successful line, the Darling 58, is just, it's currently under regulatory review with the USDA. And again, the public comment period just ended. Uh, proponents hope that the GE chestnut will play a pivotal role in restoration in conjunction with back crossbreeding and other management tools. So also in this landscape, just a few miles from one of the field trial sites is the Onondaga Nation. So that's circled in red which is part of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in central and upstate New York. So this group of six confederated nations are now on reserved land, um, land holdings that are perhaps obviously fractions of what they were before Washington's campaign in the late 19th century. Um, I had met with and worked with citizens of both Onondaga and Tuscarora when I was previously working on my master's at ESF. And when I started thinking about the chestnut project, these sovereign lands jumped to the top of my thinking. Um, with a species that, however slow moving it may be, proponents hope it'll introgress into wild populations and ultimately spread without human assistance. So I wondered what that meant for indigenous sovereignty. And to get to some of the, these questions, I uh, I, the work I'm most passionate about lies at this intersection between public engagement with science and technology and environmental justice with the aim of developing inclusive engagement practices um, with communities, stakeholders, and publics, or practices that reflect principles of inclusive governance. And for today, I focus on the role of environmental justice in these processes. And these are pretty well known, widely cited across lots of things, uh, three pillars of environmental justice, recognition, participation, and distribution. Um, so recognition that there is a subpopulation that's affected uniquely, distribution, dis the distribution of environmental goods and bads, and participation is partic participating in processes and decisions that affect them. And for this paper, I focus on recognition as a critical starting point for engaging, I'm gonna knock it all the way out, with environmental justice work. So for this recognition of identity and recognition um, that environmental benefits and burdens correlate strongly with that identity. Identity can be complex and there are some indigenous scholars that really take issue with environmental justice as a framework because they see it as putting them in the bucket of a minority within the dominant population. And to them, they are sovereign entities that should be protected and treated accordingly. But other indigenous scholars and leaders leverage this idea um, of recognition of sovereignty. So within the environmental justice framework to engage with environmental issues. And just a quick nuts and bolts slide or two. Um, when the study area that we, where we conducted this research is at and with the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment in Syracuse, New York, with the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, the Indigenous Environmental Network, the American Chestnut Foundation, the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project. So these are all organizations that we worked with and studied. Um, and through you know, to get to the data we'll talk about was a lot of semi-structured interviews and participant observation, followed by a thematic analysis um, 
encoding for environmental justice dimensions and then landing at sovereignty and worldviews, which is what I'll move on to next. So the big two themes that came out of um, this particular part of the work uh, are sovereignty and worldviews. And starting with sovereignty, really unpacking what it means to recognize sovereignty. Um, I found these three theme themes in my data the specific considerations for traditional, traditional Haudenosaunee governance institutions. So all six of these, uh, the six nations of the Confederacy have their own governments, and then they have the central fire, so the confederated government, um, where they all come together. And part of the sovereignty question considers and gives time for these governance systems to work in their own terms. Um, some of that includes thinking about what these terms and ideas mean in their own native languages. Um, I'll talk a bit about epistemic dominance here in a few minutes, but assuming their governments should work in a particular way that fits ours, uh, reflects the dominance of a colonial worldview and is something we can think critically about. And then he, here there's a longstanding treaty agreement dating back to the Chuvar Wampum with the Dutch in the early 17th century. That's now evolved to be with the US government. The Chuvar Wampum is interesting because it's known as the ship in the, can, the, ship in the canoe, uh, both moving in the same river, river of life, not interfering with the other until a time where cooperation is called for. So it's really relevant to some of these biotech questions because for the most part, the environmental leaders that I've spoken with in these communities don't want to tell the U.S. government how to do its thing. It just doesn't want that to impact their own livelihoods. So that those are separate and necessarily putting a stop on a project. Um, and then number three, important here is the long-standing mistrust around tribal consultation, which is really currently the only place that a lot of engagement, formal engagement, happens. And that's just something to consider as we think about honoring sovereignty and ways to improve that relationship. And here comes a long quote that I think is particularly telling. Uh, so the lack of outreach by federal agencies on this decision, referring to the chestnut, usually we know somebody in a federal agency that we can call or turn to on a specific issue and we don't have that for this project. I'm still a little unclear about the regulatory role of each of these agencies in releasing this chestnut. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead. And he, this, this participant says, they feel like that's the most efficient and appropriate way for uh, overall consultation plan. Would be the most efficient and appropriate way for federal and state agencies to engage about a specific issue here. Um, and I didn't feel like that had happened. And this, this quote comes about four years ago um, and not a whole lot changed. Um, and I know the public comment period has, has come in which the public consultation period is open for the tribal groups. And um, the, the public facing statement that the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force put out is they did call for a full environmental impact statement. So they are really concerned about um, thinking critically about the impacts. So again, we're thinking about how sovereignty fits into this question of environmental justice. And my data really started to point me to this idea that sovereignty is only partly about governing rights of like the governing rights. So being able to, to sort of have self-determination and the governing rights within their tribal boundaries. Um, sovereignty is also about living in accordance with worldview. And here I do something really classy and quote myself because <laughs> that's what I do. Um, but thinking about recognition of worldview has two big components. And one, recognizing the difficult histories of indigenous life in the US, as well as the epistemic dominance of Western scientific perspectives have largely prevented indigenous peoples from living in accordance with their worldviews. Ignoring these worldview distinctions risks reproducing environmental injustices that are again, rooted in the dominance of other ways of relating to and knowing and making decisions about the natural environment. And to, to quote another participant directly, um, thinking about the restoration of a species seemed to me when I first started this work like a pretty universal good, like it was a good thing to try to do. 
But one of my biggest aha moments is, is coming up here in this next quote. So if the, the, the original instructions handed down to um, the Haudenosaunee citizens talk about accepting the cycles on earth as they are now. And if those cycles include all kinds of invasive plants and all kinds of species loss, I don't wanna say it doesn't matter, it's heartbreaking and it's traumatic, but that does not change our original instructions to live within those cycles of what is on the earth now. This quote has so much to unpack. Um, I spent a lot of time with this, partic this particular participant and they always have little nuggets that I end up chewing on for days or weeks after, but this one hits me years later, like still pretty regularly. Um, a lot of us in collaborative work, engagement work, think about like a, a problem, like the governance of chestnut restoration, for example, because that's just how it works in the academy and kind of in agency work. We pick a thing, a set of solutions are constructed, we debate about them, try to be inclusive. Um, but I'm not sure we're yet able to fully capture the striking differences in worldviews and what that means for working and living together. Um, so many decisions about biotechnologies are based on fundamental assumptions about what public goods are. And I think that even of itself requires some critical thinking. So my aha moment or breakdown, breakthrough, whatever, um, is that conservation as we know it is based on epistemic dominance of Western scientific traditions. What do I do with that? Um, so how can we move forward solving environmental problems um, with or without biotechnologies, without unpacking what this could mean. Um, and so here is where we kind of step briefly away from um, my established data and more on some, some newer ideas. So bear with me and thanks for your thoughts. <laughs> um, so I, I've been seeing this phrase tossed around more and more lately. And I think that means I'm spending time in the right circle. Um, because in response to this idea of epistemic dominance or like one way of knowing one worldview is the, the way um, we make our decisions, this idea of epistemic humility floats up um, acknowledging if our knowledge of the world is always filtered, interpreted, and in important ways constructed by our a priori faculties, then we can never know things as they truly are. And we are forced to accept a degree of humility with our respect to our scientific pronouncements. I think in other words, that means we only ever understand a, like our piece of what we see. Um, and I think another way to, to think about that, bringing in some feminist STS scholarship is thinking about this idea of strong objectivity. And in a nutshell, strong objectivity coming from Sandra Harding, one of the founders of feminist STS theories, um, really has us looking at the ways in which different lived experiences, different people occupying different lived experiences, coming to describe a system, coming to work in a system, really brings you closer to what might actually be objectivity. So if each of us has our own perspective based on our own lenses, you have lots of different back backgrounds and lots of different perspectives, then you're getting closer to understanding a system. And I'm, then I would argue, then we're gonna get closer to governing that system more effectively and more justly. So <laughs> woo, diversity, equity, and inclusion are on every call for some of these things we've talked about. But how do we take these ideas and address them both theoretically and practically? So what could epistemic um, humility work, look like in chestnut restoration. Um, the questions that I think about are what kinds of knowledge is being used to make restoration choices? Um, whose knowledge and in what context? So there's a big call for local knowledge. There's a big call for traditional ecological knowledge. But there's also a lot of really important work about the colonial extractive nature of using traditional ecological knowledge. So attending to that kind of power imbalance and being intentional about collaboration instead of extracting. Uh, how are these different knowledge bases bring, being brought together? Um, so how are we thinking about academic expertise, community expertise, um, tribal expertise? And what is the role of facilitated engagement in all of this? Um, it's my hope and pretty strident belief that uh, facilitating facilitated engagement can actually bring a lot of these important issues into conversation. Uh, and then thinking about how it could take us back out to 
environmental justice questions? Um, how might more explicit attention to epistemic dominance reorient environmental justice scholarship and practice more broadly? So in other words, if we're starting to think through and reflect on the fundamental assumptions we hold as either scientists, social scientists, activists, um, take you know any form of our identity, if we think about that as this is just one corner, this is just one uh, representation of the issue, then we're more open to thinking about these other perspectives and that includes other disciplines and other, other perspectives in general. How can practicing epistemic humility then serve to facilitate improved interdisciplinary work and support allied scholarship and minimize extractive scholarship? So again, that comes back to the version that we know, the version that I know is its own piece of the puzzle, but there's a larger picture. Um, and how might these ideas shape how we, we engage with the governance of biotechnology? So, so often the narrative is pro-tech scientists and anti-tech indigenous leaders, and that narrative leaves out so much rich, richness. Um, in fact, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians wrote in um, to support the, the chestnut in their public comment period and actually won an orchard there on their reserved land at Koala Boundary in Western North Carolina. Um, and like I said, the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, on the other hand, their formal position and comment argued that the GIAC needed a full environmental impact statement. So the pro-anti narrative is pretty well disrupted just with that alone. Um, and that, that pro-anti narrative also misses nuance, which in my mind is where all the action is and where the good dialogue is. And so thinking about more generally and where we can apply these ideas, um, of epistemic humility to the governance of emerging biotech more broadly. Thinking about justice, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion as an orientation. Um, just being explicit about that. I know a lot of us do work that, that points us that way, but really thinking about how to make that an explicit part of the work we do. And in that sense, the expertise could be flattened in a lot of the ways I already talked about. Um, your your discipline, your perspective is one piece of a puzzle in opening up what, what counts as expertise. And recognizing the expertise of, of lived experience. So, you know, the, we call for diversity. Well, we, we call for the diversity for lots of reasons, not just to be um, politically correct, but because in order to deeply understand a system and how it affects different groups of people, it's really important to think about who those groups of people are and what might be differentiated impacts. And I think a lot of people here worry about conflating some of these ideas with post-truth. With post and I, I understand that concern, but everyone having different expertise is diff not the same thing as everyone having truth. And I, I, we can debate that offline, I think. Um, and also thinking about sovereignty where it's relevant to tribal groups or to um, indigenous peoples worldwide, depending on where you work. And thinking again about worldview diversity, so not just identity diversity, but really um, one of the, my colleagues from the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force starts almost every presentation I've ever seen him give with like, our worldview is really different. It's not like it's just not, we don't think, look at the world the same way you do. And if he's starting all of his talks that way, I think that's a point he really wants to, to drive home. And so I try to think about ways that I could bring that idea into broader decision-making. And again, um, everyone has their own expertise being distinct from everyone having their own truth. Um, and bringing this all together with some of the engagement work I do, um, how can engagement serve as a mechanism for epi epistemic humility in the governance of environmental biotechnologies? And with that, um, that's this is the article that a lot of this work was based on. And then I, I told you where I kind of jumped the shark and went on something new. But again, that's uh, what I've been thinking about lately. And I look forward to figuring out how to translate that work into practice. And I'm going to stop share. Great. Thank you so much, um, Katie. So we're going to open it up now for hopefully a lively um, discussion. So just to remind everyone, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function, um, or you can type your question into the chat box, um, and we can read them out if you don't want to um, ask your question out loud. 
Um, so why people are are thinking of that, Katie, what, what struck me was, I think the, the quote you put up there that you said sort of you've been contemplating for a number of years now really stuck out to me as well. And this, this idea about, um, in essence, it seemed like accepting the results of our behavior or experiences. And, and I read that as, an, as, as not necessarily meaning that we should then try to fix it by reestablishing the chestnut. So I'm curious if you could um, unpack maybe some of your own thinking in terms of, of what that means. It reminds me a lot of some of the other environmental philosophies of, you know, are humans part of nature or are we separated from it? And so what's your thinkings on that in terms of your discussions with, um, with some of the, the native tribes and indigenous tribes that you've been talking to of how they come at that, that, that philosophy? Thank you, Todd. Good question. Um, it's one that I struggle with because, well, gosh, if we broke it, we should fix it. Um, and they are also very quick to point out, we well, didn't broke it, the white people broke it. So um, that's one dimension of it. But another piece of it, I think, is really echoes with the moral hazard um, conversations around using biotech for species protection. Like if we have this tool, um, then the systemic things that are that are producing species loss won't be as addressed addressed as effectively. And I think for them, it's reorienting relationship um, with non-human nature. And so that's definitely part of it. And I think too, just reestablishing different, a different kind of relationship with, with the land is what most people that I've talked to are really interested in. And and another paper I've written about um, the same the same body of work, but more detailed on uh, where there is, like it is important to restore species when they're like cultural keystone species. So it's not just like a never, like the salmon, there's work done to restore salmon in some parts of the um, Northwest. There's, it's not a never thing. It's fundamentally from the quote I pulled from and the conversations I've had really focusing more on what is the nature of the relationship to non-human nature or to the land. And, um, do these biotech examples represent just another example of like colonial hubris, um, which again, a lot of these arguments come up well beyond just the indigenous conversations. They're certainly present all over these debates, but thinking about the hubris and the moral hazard of not addressing like that, that systemic problem of relationship disruption with the land. Just to remind everyone to use the raise hand function or, or type in your questions. Um, so I'm still waiting for some more. So I have I have lots of questions. So I'm just going to keep asking until people <laughs> interrupt me. Um, it's maybe an unfair question, but in in your experience with with this work, um, it's a question of um, in essence the final decision, and particularly. The, the sovereignty of, of, of the actual tribal lands themselves and how you like, I'm trying to think of how to ask this. Like, um, I think I know the answer, but have there been examples of where we have not gone forward with something because a particular tribal decision went the opposite, right? So for some of these applications that you could see where you can in sense and they kind of wall them off from entering into tribal lands, but some of these examples, like the chestnut that are going to naturally move and potentially move in there, you might not have that ability. So what's the actual decision framework mechanism if, say, one particular tribal land says no? Um, does that mean the U.S. would then just not go forward? Both in an ideal world, but in a practical world, too, maybe. Yeah, and I think that this is where the the heterogeneity comes into play too, right? Like it's not just tribal lands, all tribal lands are off limits. It's, you know, this particular confederacy has a more artic has more articulated a pretty clear policy on genetically engineered organisms. Um, and I think this is where there's some really interesting work to be done if we can find money around uh, after the regulatory decision is made uh, about the chestnut there's a million other tiny decisions that will be made. And one of the sets of issues that I've talked with some of the developers on and um, people at the American Chestnut Foundation is, could you basically de develop a landscape map of acceptability where you layer in both habitat suitability and social 
suitability and have kind of like zones of exclusion where buffers around tribal lands, like all sorts of it, the, the folks think they know a chestnut ecology pretty well. So if that's true, then we should be able to think about like, well, what kind of buffer might we want around tribal lands or what kind of um, landscape level decisions might we want to engage in? I think the challenge is the regulatory system sets it up so that it's sovereign to sovereign. Um, there's a go, go or no go. And that's the end of it. When this chestnut case shows us that the actual lived experience of the chestnut, of living with the chestnut is much more complicated and really takes place on the landscape itself. Um, I think to answer what might have been your first question, there's a few um, pipeline examples, like that, not not many, <laughs> but at least some of the work here in North Carolina, some of the pipelines have been at least paused um, when a tribe didn't want it. But for something like the chestnut, which I think is a, a quite quite a bit different, not locked up in the same political economy stuff. Um, they're not really interested in telling what the US government should or shouldn't do. They just want to be able to do their own thing. And so if we can figure out, again, a landscape level decision, um, as far as I understand it, that's fine with them. I'm not gonna say that, I'm not speaking for all of them. That's why I want to qualify it, as far as I understand it. Great. So. Um, at one point, I thought I saw Nora's hand up, so I want to give Nora the opportunity to ask a question. I don't see Nora. But maybe not. So maybe there we'll we go. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. um, so I. Um, uh, you know, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about maybe some of the uh, things you learned that didn't get into publication, especially around the um, difficulty of engaging with people who have been kind of so burned in the past by collaborations and engagements. Uh, and I just kind of wondered if you could speak a little bit more to that aspect and the kinds of soft skills people might need to bring to those situations. It's a really good question. Um, one of the only, the only way that I got to do any of this work is because I had previously met a couple of the people that became our um, our gatekeepers, um, like, and I had met them through the right channels. So it's really about a lot of um, serendipity um, and paying attention to to when opportunities are there. But I think one of the this is going to be a little bit of a roundabout answer. Um, one of the best tools I think I have developed. Um, through this work was actually through some other group work, thinking about deep listening uh, and really being able to integrate deep listening with gently directing to make sure you're actually kind of getting close to what you think should be your data set has <laughs> been a, a tricky balance. Um, but I, I, I also think that once you are developing relationships with people that may be your gatekeeper for lack of a better phrase. One, you have to be ready for it to take some time. Um, I've done a number of trips to central New York that weren't data collection. It was basically relationship building. And thankfully I've had the kind of support coming out of the Chestnut Project and some other work that let that happen. Um, I don't think any of the, we would have gotten a fraction of our work without that sort of relationship building part of the, the research project. Um, that was that was fundamental. I feel really lucky to have gotten that. Does that start to answer your questions? Hey, uh, the next person I have on my list is uh, Scott. So Scott, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, it's sort of a follow up to your question, Todd. Um, and it's, it's how do the sovereign nations resolve differences um, amongst themselves? So if you have a federal government making decisions based on 
sovereign nations are taking those into account. How would either the Haudenosaunee or the Cherokee resolve what you mentioned might be their difference in the chestnut or even within the Haudenosaunee if you have six groups there, is consensus required to make a decision or how do they accommodate potential differences? I mean, that's a really good question, but that's not one I'm in the position of answering. Um, neither, I'm not a citizen of none of those places and I'm not in any of the tribal councils. I do know that um, of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, they're not, all, they're, they're, the six are not identical to each other. I do know that, that um, they have slightly different governance structures depending on um, a lot of different factors. And interesting question, and I don't know if this is what you were getting at, is what would happen um, or how might Cherokee and the Haudenosaunee interact with each other? And that, I mean, you know, that would be a really interesting set of questions, but, you know, I don't have insider information. It's definitely not my my place to share what their tribal councils look like. That's all pretty private. Um, but I do know, I do know that one of the, um, that Onondaga, which is one of the six, I think it's one of the few, if not the only, in the what's now the United States that has its traditional government. Um, so these are some long-standing old traditions. So I think working out differences is not new to them. <laughs> so I, I'm not entirely sure of all the processes. That's a good question. Um, that's why I think it's it would just be important to give space, both time and physical space for for these processes to unfold because they don't necessarily happen in the cycle, like a legislative cycle or something. Hey, we have a question from Hector in the chat box and, and they're asking, how would the concept of living within cycles apply to how one might deal with climate change? That's a really good question. Um, I haven't talked to anyone in either place about climate change specifically. Um, except to know that they that they are seeing different, you know, animal and plant behaviors, like a bunch of us have. So, um, one of the challenges that I have found in working on public engagement with science and technology is the quick um, tendency of people to think about, well, if it's, if it's biotech and it's climate change and it's vaccination and it's COVID. And there is there are some shared um, characteristics having to do with trust and institutional behaviors, but they're all really quite different. Um, and I really don't necessarily want to think that because I have some data on what some people think about um, a genetically engineered chestnut, I can make the same leap with climate change. But I would conjecture a little bit to think that um, the, the suggestion might be for us to think about what our relationship is to the land. And I mean, late stage capitalism is, you know, it, it's given us some problems. So if we want to think about uh, accepting the cycles, we may want to, one, not necessarily assume that everything I talk about is transferable, but two, thinking about the relationship to the land is, is an important question. Hey, uh, Andy, I, you're next on my list, so uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Katie. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I'm trying to think of the, the best way to word this question, um, but you mentioned a philosophy of governance where tribes are in their own canoes and you don't really interfere with the other canoe or government unless those canoes are going to interact. Um, and it got me thinking of that, you know, that um perception of interaction is really what you're looking at like when you decide to move your canoe and how you move it and i guess i'm just wondering from your perspective has the interpretation of that interaction like when you move and make a different like make a change in your policies um how has that changed when we talk about you know editing these open systems that you know we're all interacting in if that <laughs> makes sense right yeah so the ship and the canoe is um coming out of the Tour Wampum, which is a, a treaty, it's an actual belt treaty um, that dates back to 1600s. The date right now currently escapes me. Um, but it, like you noted, it was, you know, for European Americans, we have our ship, um, we have their canoe and not interrupting or not interfering with the others in, until it's necessary. So the question is, when is it necessary, right? Um, and I think part of the 
answer like it like is, is editing or genetically engineering free roaming or environmental releases of species part of that question um and it could be but i think one of the other challenges is um priority so i i think it's important for the haudenosaunee environmental task force leaders or it's important to know that they have a limited bandwidth like the rest of us and really thinking about priority and where their priorities are for taking care of their communities. Um, and so I'm not sure that the GE chestnut is, well, actually it wasn't a very high priority. Um, it wasn't as big of an immediate threat. Um, it's important to sovereignty, but at the end of the day, the unfortunate truth is there's lots of attacks on sovereignty in a lot of um, Indian country. And so thinking about what those priorities are and, I'm, and to sort of give an example, I guess, and when I, for my master's work, I worked with the Onondaga Nation um, as they engaged with a, a regional creek revitalization plan. And that's something they did jump in on because the creek ran through their land. Uh, Onondaga Lake is a very sacred site to them. Um, so there are examples where the Haudenosaunee leaders step up and don't just say, oh, we should accept as is. Um, and what that means for genetically engineered organisms or gene edited organisms, I guess we're not sure yet. Um, but to, to your point, like, I wondered too, and still do, like, is this not a point of interaction where what we're doing in the ship might interfere with your canoe? Um, and I think some of the questions around free prior and informed consent coming out of gene drive work in general um, will, will push us into making more clear decisions and not just have fuzzy ideas. We have a question from Amanda in the chat box and it's it's reading, regenerative agriculture is a field that is built on indigenous knowledge, but is promoted by other groups. How do we properly acknowledge indigenous knowledge in agriculture? <laughs> um, that's a really interesting question. I think there's a lot of questions around um, what is the line between acknowledgement and celebrating versus appropriating? Um, I mean, I think one of the important things to realize is that although indigenous is a useful term, it's also just a heuristic that what we are talking about are groups of people. Um, so if you know specifically like what agricultural practices are coming from what group of people, then talk to the people. <laughs> like there isn't a, like a, a big rule that helps us understand like what to do with indigenous knowledge or not, um, keeping in mind that indigenous peoples, like I said, is a term, but it's a heuristic device it doesn't necessarily describe effectively all of the thousands of groups of people um so the first step i would think um not this not really being my wheelhouse but i would think thinking if you have a specific practice in mind or set of practices in mind figure out who right so figure out what um if there's a contemporary tribal group that you could connect like to, if that may have some sort of um practice that you think you're borrowing from that's like I think it's really important to think about indigenous peoples as still being here and as being incredibly heterogene heterogeneous so think about the who is my my only real recommendation on that one We may be out of questions, but I want to give people some additional opportunities to either raise their hands or, or add something into the chat box. Um, and also, Katie, for you to propose questions to everyone in the group that you might want help with or answers to, potentially as well. Yeah, and this might not be to everyone in the group, but um, I am interested in thinking about how these ideas can fold into um, governance, like proposals, like what, I don't know, like thinking about either designing engagement or thinking about the kind of work a lot of we a lot of us do either together and kind of like I'm thinking about how to how to build this into the work more explicitly that we do at the GES Center. Um, so that's it's kind of my, I don't know, a call for collaboration or a call for speculating on how. And I think it draws a little bit on what Louie talked about. Was that just last week? Um, how we can play our role as academics and being better allies and being 
um, being in position to use our places to empower. So anyway, looking for collaborators, always looking for ideas, um, but thanks for the questions. They were really interesting ones. Well, now we have two more, so you're not done yet. Um, so Dylan is asking, um, he's curious if there are any specific chestnut restoration efforts you consider to be most promising. Dylan, I don't know what you mean. Can you clarify? Like what kind of effort? Do you mean breeding? Do you mean like, I don't, I don't get it. Is he still around? <laughs> I've, I've unmuted you, Dylan, so you can ask um, in person. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm sorry if that is out of the scope of the um, the specific talk. I was just I don't know much about the American uh, chestnut, you know, restoration sort of movement. And I was wondering if, you know, what sort of like practically we're talking about in terms of what, um, you know, what what actions need to be done in a you know in a way that is considering um environmental justice Does that makes sense um i i mean i think the general answer is that it's a combination of breeding programs plus biotechnology um and a lot of citizen science but i guess there's a, I don't know, in terms of environmental justice, there's still a lot of decisions left to be made. So the, the actual technicalities of restoration, the, the thinking is that you're going to need both breeding and biotech to work because um, you need genetic diversity from the range, but you actually need the um, blight resistance. So you need those working in concert. Um, where it's actually going to work on the landscape remains to be seen because we're looking at a very different set of forests than, we're, than the chestnuts left. Um, and what that means for environmental justice, I think that's the $64,000 question that we can, we still have time to develop the right kind of decision-making system for. Stay tuned. And yeah, we've got a question from, from Jason who's asking, who do you think should initiate engagements with particular tribal governments as we face other emerging environmental biotechnologies? You're trying to write a job for me? Because, uh, no, um, I think that's a fabulous question. And I think that the boundary work is where it's at. Um, and what would be great is if there were more indigenous scholars giving, getting the positions they need to be getting that they deserve around some of these issues. So I know there's some work um, coming out of some initiatives getting indigenous scholars more interested in genetics and genomics and thinking about their role in not just, you know, human, human genomics, but those kinds of work that we do around conservation and ag. Um, so the first, the, in the medium to longer term, I think it's, it's really great to see these indigenous scholars get more access to spaces where they can play these roles. Um, Otherwise, it's really tough because like the, the work that we've done came on a series of luck, like a serendipity, right? Like we happen to know and happen to know and happen to know. Um, but I, I think one of the key things would be really nice to do is building in, as we talk a lot about responsible innovation, innovation here in the center, um, building in some more explicit pieces into anticipation or the early and upstream thing as we identify stakeholders and looking more explicitly around who is, um, what the legal responsibilities might be when we get to a regulatory question, but starting much further upstream, working with interdisciplinary project teams like we try to do <laughs> and try to develop um, so that we can look out and see what those stakeholders might be and where we can tap indigenous scholars and practitioners to do the work so that somebody, you know, so that we're bringing power to the actual um, groups of people there and not just speaking for them. I don't know, Jason, we'll work it out. <laughs> okay, I don't see any more hands or questions in the chat box. So I just wanna thank you again, Katie, for, for stepping in at the very last minute. Um, and again, for everyone to, you know, send your thoughts and powers out to, to June out in Colorado, who's dealing with just some unimaginable 
um, circumstances. Um, and also to remind everyone that there's no colloquium next week. Um, so please go out and vote if you haven't, if you're able to in the US. Um, if not, help people get to the polls or take that time to think more broadly about um, the importance of civic engagement and how that actually impacts um, everything in our daily lives, pretty much. Um, so please, everyone, help me thank Katie um, again for stepping in at the very last minute um, and putting together a great um, presentation and, and leading a, an excellent um, conversation. So thank you again, Katie. Thank you for having me. Nice to see all of you or talk to all of you. <laughs>